Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to our webinar here today, How to Be a World Series Team in Customer Support. Our event is sponsored by GoToAssist. Appreciate their team putting this event on. Rich Gallagher is our guest, joins me on screen here for a couple minutes as we open up the event. I'll give you a little more background on Rich in a moment and some of the things that we're going to try and accomplish here today. But I wanted to start off, Rich, asking you a question about this idea of team. Mm -hmm. And in an ideal world, if everything fell into place, what would the ideal kind of customer support team look like to you? How would it ultimately be structured? Well, that's a great question, James, and it really ties into some changes in the philosophy of how you coach winning teams in baseball and in customer support. When a lot of people think about having a great team, they think about being a strong leader, but in reality, my experience and the experience of a lot of behavioral science is that your success really lies in building confidence and skills in the team members themselves and pushing as much responsibility and authority down to the team level as possible. So in a sense, your goal is to not just be a good coach, but to have a team of coaches. Awesome. And folks, as we go through, you're, you're going to hear this kind of baseball theme throughout the presentation. And uh, the only background you need to know about me, James Hilliard here, your moderator, is that I also do a whole lot of youth sports coaching, soccer, but tons of baseball, Little League Baseball I'm affiliated with. And so um, I'll share some little stories. And, and Rich and I have had the opportunity to in the past. So we're, we'll all bring in some of those. And we'll be talking again a lot about teamwork. And, and baseball is going to be a running analogy here. As your moderator here, um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on a couple of things, including questions and comments. So I want to invite all of you out there, Michelle, talking to you, Lynn, I want to invite Amy, you as well, Jim, and everyone else on the line here, Tammy, Val, I see you coming on board. I invite you all to submit questions and comments anytime during the presentation. It might be something you're struggling with with your team. Maybe you just need us to clarify something. If you want to add, maybe it's a good little tip or something that has worked for you to add that, right? We can discuss it. So get that into us early and often. You can also follow us on Twitter. We'll put those up on the screen. I will also, in just a moment here, copy and paste those out to you. But at GoToAssist, of course, so you can follow our sponsor, at Gallagher POC belongs to Rich Gallagher and his point of contact group. Uh, I'll give you a little more background on him and then Hilly Prods if you need to reach out and follow me at all. But uh, Rich is with us. We're glad to have him back on board. Uh, he is uh, several things. He has been the leader of some of these customer support teams that we're going to be talking about. So he has actually practiced and done that. These days he gets out there and does trainings and helps teams become really those World Series teams that they want to be. He's also a practicing psychotherapist in the great state of New York, which uh, goes a long way in helping him not only in that venture, but also in the customer support area uh, as well. So uh, lots of good information that we're going to be hearing from Rich here today, again, a couple of polls that are going to pop up, all that. What I'm going to do right now, this is not a glitch, but I'm going to turn off the webcam so we can focus on the content that Rich has uh, planned for us here today, and then if we have the opportunity, we can pop these back on during the Q&A. But with that, Rich, I think we've given you uh, control of the slide deck, sir, so I want to turn things over to you, and we'll, uh, we'll dive on in and keep going on this idea of how to build this great team. Okay, well, thank you, James, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you today, and this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent a lot of my career managing customer contact operations in the software industry. Uh, I had a track record of dramatically turning around the performance of those operations. In more recent years, I've written several books on workplace communication skills, as well as one of the first textbooks on managing customer support operations. And that leads me to the first point that I want to make today about our theme of building a World Series team in customer support, and that's the Baseball isn't just a cheesy metaphor for support teams. If you've been around the webinar business for a bit um, as an attendee, you've probably seen a lot of sports metaphors about how to have a winning team in the X. And often it's used as sort of a loose metaphor for attitude and motivation and performance. In reality, because remember, I'm a psychotherapist as well as a former support manager. I find that there's a lot of fairly recent and fairly common behavioral science in the management of a successful support team or the management of a successful athletic team. I'm going to be covering four key areas today in terms of coaching, metrics, training, and also customer care that really are factors in having a successful support team. But it all boils down to the fact that your team in customer support is managed by 
much the same things as professional athletes, which is success and professional recognition. And they're turned off by the same things, which unfortunately are part of the daily grind of support, like metrics, micromanagement, and having their failures pointed out to them. And I have found, again, looking at a long history of turning around the performance of good teams, that the same team skills drive the success of both teams, which is coaching, uh, workshopping common problems as a team, and an incessant focus on the mechanics. Um, I love doing these webinars here with uh, James Hilliard because he's not only a baseball coach in Little League, but he is a really good coach. He truly gets a lot of the mechanics of motivating kids to have fun, learn, and do a really good job. So before I get to teaching you anything, I just want to pulse you folks in the audience and ask you folks, of those four areas that I brought up, what are some of your biggest challenges in managing support teams? I'm going to hand things back over to my lovely assistant, James, and he's got a poll up for you now. We do have that poll up. If you choose that bottom answer, something else, right, is your biggest challenge that's not listed there. We've listed coaching employee performance, keeping up with those metrics and milestones, the issue resolution, dealing with customer situations. But if you do that something else, go ahead into the question area and let me know what is your something else. Rich, I'm going to flip the switch and turn this poll back on you and, and see that over your, your, your career when you were managing teams or when you're in there helping teams these days, is there one of these that you still come across your kind of biggest challenge? Absolutely. Since I'm actually running this webinar, I actually get to pick two of them. <laughs> and, uh, okay. well, I'm <laughs> going to pick coaching employee performance because we're going to talk a lot about this in just a few minutes. But moving from a fear-based environment where people are afraid of getting caught or punishment or looking bad to a strength-based environment where everybody feels respected and looked up to and we focus on helping people play their strengths. That was the bedrock of the kind of performance transformation we saw. And then the other one I'm going to pick is the last one, which is dealing with customer situations. At the end of the day, technical support really pivots around how good a customer feels with their interactions with you. We had an incessant focus on learning how to handle your very worst customer situations. I'm trying my age here a bit, but uh, I, I'm a big fan of a show called the Adams Family, which was a, a television show back in my day about a creepy family. And uh, Uncle Fester would say, it's a gloomy day. Let's go for a drive around the cemetery. My equivalent to that was I, I'd workshop how to handle your worst customer situations when we had a really bad customer on the phone. I'd gather people on the speakerphone. So I see we've got our results up here. And uh, this is not a, uh, a surprising distribution here. So of the folks that are here in the audience, uh, some people talk about coaching customer situations like me. A lot of people are talking about metrics and milestones, almost two-thirds of you. And uh, that's something I have some very strong opinions on that we're going to speak to in a few minutes. So this is right down broad with what I want to be talking about today. So let's park that for a couple of minutes. And now I want to first focus on the whole question of coaching people like a champion. And this is, as I hinted before, a matter of great misconception among both sports team leaders who aren't used to it and also support team leaders. And the metaphor I'm going to use is this man pictured here, which is Joe Torrey. I suspect most of you have never been booed by 300 people at a speaking engagement. I have. And my advice to not do that yourselves is don't mention your Joe Torrey stories while you're speaking in Boston, like I did at one point. Uh, I survived that experience, but this actually is a very good metaphor. Joe Torrey wrote one of the best books ever written on strength-based coaching, which is uh, a strategy that I'm going to focus on here. It's not a communication skills book. It's a sports book. The book is called Joe Torrey's Ground Rules for Winners. It came out in 2001. I believe it's still in print. And uh, if you're as interested in the mechanics of coaching people as I am, I highly recommend that book. The thing about Torrey is that, as you know, he led the New York Yankees to four world championships around the turn of the millennium. And he wrote a book that laid out in great detail how he managed to motivate egotistical, highly paid superstars to pull together and perform as a team. I sometimes refer to this as sort of the all-star team effect. Just having a bunch of talented individual contributors does not always mean 
that you're going to have good performance as a team. And Tori's view is that a strength-based approach where even when they're messing up, even when they need coaching, even when they need to have their skills built, when team members always feel respected, valued, and have a voice, this is when they're going to perform at their best. He gives a lot of great stories about in the in the depths of the World Series, how individual players would uh, get down on themselves because of how they performed in the last game, or because they were or weren't in the lineup, and how he uses his gut to try to build people's confidence as his first way of working. The other thing that's very important to know about Joe Torre is that he grew up in a verbally abusive household, as he laid out, out in the book. And one of the things he took away from that that uncomfortable experience was that as a coach, he doesn't yell at people. He doesn't get up in the clubhouse and give motivational speeches. He gives hundreds of tiny little troubleshooting discussions um, with people that are positive, they're strength-based, and they never shame people. Here's a very quick example of how Joe Torre manages his team. 20 years ago, if somebody coughed up two home runs and was losing the game, the typical manager would go out to the mound and say, if you don't get your act together, I'm going to pull you off the mound. Torrey would go out to the mound and say, I notice your foot fastball is dropping a foot closer to the plate. How is your arm strength? Do we need to tweak your delivery? You know, uh, How's your mechanics here? Or are you running out of gas? Do we need to bring a reliever in? So he'd go out there and give a math lecture. And because it was done in such a way that never shamed the other team member and collaborated with them, they pulled together for the good of the team and not just whether they wanted to be in the game or not. And that was a very key part of Tori being very successful as a coach. Rich, I'm just going to jump in here because you're talking about strength-based coaching, youth sports. There's a group called the Positive Coaching Alliance. I've taken some courses yeah. with them. One of the things that they come out and talk about is for within youth sports, and this probably goes up to major leagues and into customer support centers, for every one negative comment, you need about 10 positives to overcome that negative comment. And with, with kids, sometimes I need to do 20 if you come in with that negative. And so I try not to. Sometimes it slips out. It gets out there. Or something is perceived as a negative. So then there's that work. But um, talk to, to with, with that as a little mindset here, let's talk about strength-based coaching and how you know focusing on the positives does a whole lot more than that one little negative. That one little negative can tear down so much in someone. Absolutely correct. In fact, it can change the relationship between you and an employee. And I want to pick up on that great observation that you just made, James, which is, you know, how you have to recover from negative comments. I feel very strongly that when you're managing a customer support team, you should avoid at all costs having to make those negative comments that you have to recover from that strength-based coaching is fundamentally based on the strengths and interests of the employees. Now, I was a working support manager for many years. I, I respect and understand the world that you live in. I realize that sometimes you have employees fighting with each other. Sometimes you have employees who say unfortunate things to customers. Sometimes people don't seem to be working as hard as they could be working. And I'm still going to say that a fully strength-based approach is based on building skills and not finding mistakes and that actually normalizes failure. That when somebody messes up with a customer or struggles with something and doesn't work hard, that you paint that position as that of a totally reasonable person and then co-create new skills and new competencies with them. I'm going to say honestly, James, just to compare notes with you, in all the years that I managed support teams, about seven or eight years in total, uh, Anyone who worked for me for more than five minutes knew what high standards I had for how we treated our customers and how we treated each other. But people had a very high comfort zone in coming to me when they were struggling. They had a very high comfort zone in sharing their mistakes. And they knew that I would never, ever criticize them. But they also knew that I coached, that I was there to help them, and that I was never going to give up on them. So I want to break this down into some mechanics. I do entire courses, and I've written entire books on this. Uh, it's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, the book, How to Tell Anyone Anything, is on how to have really difficult workplace conversations. They're totally safe. But I want to give you a very quick summary of the mechanics of how you do strength-based coaching. The first part of strength-based coaching is to always start a conversation in a safe place. So let's say somebody uh, 
says something unfortunate to a customer. Once I had a situation where uh, one of the key people in my team was on the phone with somebody who was talking incessantly, wouldn't let him get a word in edgewise. I happened to be monitoring the phone call, which was an accepted practice in our call center. And at one point I heard him say, will you shut up so I can help you? And when I then touched base with that person afterwards, I came in with a big smile on my face and I said, wow, that customer must have really been frustrating you. I would have been really frustrated with that too. So I put myself at eye level and then we workshopped the mechanics. What I did after that was I said, you know, you know, boy, I could tell that one was really frustrating. She would have frustrated me too. Why don't we do a little role playing here? Why don't you talk to me the way that woman talked to you? And he played along and role played and I shut him right down. And then taught him the mechanics of how to use what I call the acknowledge and close. Enthusiastically acknowledging her, asking binary questions, and taking control of the conversation. My point here is I never shamed him. I never told him he shouldn't have acted that way. I never said, how would you feel if somebody said that to you? It was positive skills based and with a big smile on my face, and it worked. So you start in a safe place with saying things like, Wow, that looked really frustrating. Tell me about it. Walk me through how you do this. Or let's say somebody does something really stupid. You might use what I call the I technique, which I call how to tell someone they're stupid without using the word stupid in a sense. You know, when I did that, that didn't turn out well for me either. So start the conversation in a safe place. Workshop those safe openings before you dive into the conversation. If you do a good job at that, then you're hoping against hope that people will then start working harder or showering more often or being nice to your customers forthwith, what's probably going to happen instead is that you're going to hear their side of the story, their excuses, their rationalizations. And you're going to hit what I call the oh my gosh moment, which is what do I say now? And I want you to change that perspective from what can I say to what can I ask? Because I want you to take a learning posture towards people and realize that hearing their side of the story is awesome. So ask good questions to learn how they see the world, which leads me to the third and most important step. This is where strength-based coaching lives or dies, because it goes totally against our human nature, and most people don't do it, which is normalizing the situation. Normalizing is a mathematical term. It means doesn't mean you approve of something or that it's okay. It means that it meets a norm for the other person. Your job here is to paint their position is that of a totally reasonable person. So you're going to acknowledge and validate whatever view of the world that they're putting out there and say, absolutely, I totally get why you were frustrated. I can see why this is hard for you. You know, and it makes perfect sense that you're falling behind on your backlog because, you know, look at all the stuff that you just mentioned here. Then what you do is you can be as firm as you want with your boundaries as long as you're neutral, factual, and invite the other person to problem solve with you. This works best when there's an incentive for the other person and you make it a skills-based approach. One of my favorite lines with people when they would say something unfortunate to a customer is I would tell them, you know, if I were to call Microsoft or Hewlett Packard, I'd probably hear exactly the same thing that I just heard you say. It's probably what 98 out of 100 people would say. Now, here's what the best of the best do. How would this sound rolling off your tongue? Give this a try. So incessantly using a safe, collaborative, skills-based approach makes a dramatic difference in how people perform and gives you your very best chance of creating behavior and performance change in other people. So these aren't just rules that I just made up. Um, circling back to Joe Torrey, when Joe Torrey was in the playoffs at one of those years when they won a championship against Lou Pinella's Seattle Mariners, and Luke Pinella's Mariners lost, and Torrey went on to the World Series. Sweet Lou, as they called him, is one of those old-style, yell-at-everybody kind of coaches, and he gave a very powerful interview afterwards saying, I'm, I'm a coach from the past. This is the way we used to coach people. The way Joe Torrey coaches people is, is coaching of the future, and that's working better nowadays, and I have to learn from that. And if you look at the psychology of almost any sport, whether it's uh, Tony Dungy, who took the Colts to the Super Bowl, Phil Jackson, who won more basketball championships than anybody, uh, all of them used a fully strength-based approach that was very well documented to lead them. Which now leads me straight into the area that you folks brought up as 
your biggest struggle as managers, which is dealing with performance expectations and performance metrics. Something I have very strong opinions on and something that ties in with our strength-based philosophy. I honestly believe that metrics are the single biggest force for ruining motivation, ruining performance, and ruining the customer experience. Those of you who have been a support for a long time know from your own experience that if you emphasize things like first call resolution, then nobody escalates a call. You know that if you emphasize average handle time, then suddenly people get pushed off the phone with bad answers. And there's a perfect baseball analogy for this. And this is what I call the quality start. So as you know, if you follow baseball, that a pitcher's one win and loss record is not the best metric of how good a pitcher they are. Very often, the Cy Young Award, which goes to the best pitcher of the year, does not go to the pitcher who has the most wins. And every few years, I went back and looked at the records before this webinar, often the Cy Young Award goes to a pitcher that has a surprisingly small number of wins. And the reason for that is you can give up 10 runs and still win the game if your team scored 11 runs. Conversely, you can have a great pitching performance and still lose the game. There was a famous game, Harvey Haddix of the Pirates pitched a perfect game through nine innings, which is, almost never happens, and he still lost the game in extra innings because his team never scored any runs, and the game went into extra innings and they lost. So in baseball, they have a, a metric called a quality start, and that's a much better metric than wins and losses. Quality start is a composite metric that involves a pitcher completing at least six innings of the game, which meant they lasted through the majority of the game, but they give up no more than three earned runs in that time. And uh, whether they won or lost the game, that's a measure of how well they did. And in baseball, they use the term cheap wins versus tough losses. A cheap win is where you do a lousy job on the mound, but you win anyway because your team scored enough runs. A tough loss is a loss where you pitched really well, like Hardy Haddix, and then you know your team didn't score enough, and you lost anyway. So I want to circle this around to your metrics and support. Support metrics, especially support performance metrics, always incentivize cheap wins. Like I mentioned, first call resolution incentivizes bad answers, making customers call back, and discourages escalation. Average handle time discourages spending an appropriate amount of time investigating the problem. And it leads to using scripted responses or putting the troubleshooting burden on the customer, saying, here, hang up and try this. This way my metrics will look good, and you can go off on a wild goose chase for an hour and try something that isn't going to work. And then they call back and get told to try something else. These kind of metrics have, frankly, ruined companies and ruined support um, morale and motivation, and have ruined even the financial outcomes of a lot of these companies. And this is something that's been, there's been a lot of press on over the years. They also disincentivize tough losses. And so I'm a big fan of customer SAT ratings as a good metric because it measures something that your company cares about and your customer cares about. But even customer SAT, if you rank people on the customer SAT ratings, that disincentivizes those people who handle the tough cases where somebody might not be as happy. And so, again, my, my key here is that I'm not against performance metrics. Some people feel like no metrics is like a university without grades. I also realize many of you have metrics imposed on you, and I respect that as well. But used as a visible public metric in front of your team, they almost always hurt the quality of your team. So. My solution to this is what I call a quality support start, which is, was the case reopened? Because um, case reopening is a good measure of whether you do a good job in the eyes of the customer or not. Um, in terms of resolution time, I not only want the resolution time to be short for trivial problems, I want that resolution time to be long enough for, uh, I want that resolution time to be long enough for the problems that really need that kind of attention. I want to see appropriate escalation. So again, turning this around to first call resolution, I want first call resolution to be low for simple problems, and I want it to be, or I want it to be high for simple problems. I actually want it to be low for difficult problems. I want calls to be escalated to the right experts so that the customer is happy and that we're working efficiently. 
And then, of course, there's the external metrics that the customer weighs in on, such as comments on social media. And social media hasn't been as big a deal in customer support as we once thought it was a few years ago. However, the important takeaway from social media that has stuck with us is that we don't do our work in secret anymore. If we give somebody a bad customer experience, it used to be just a question between us and the customer and maybe their families and friends. Nowadays, there's a public spotlight on how well or how badly we do support. Uh, there is a clock sitting over my webinar as we speak. It's ticking off the time, and I'm keeping an eye on our time together today. And the first clock I bought was defective. And when I wrote the company about it, they said, sorry, you have to come back from 200 miles away and return to our store physically with an ID, because who knows who's returning these clocks. So I posted a video on their social media site uh, with a video of the defective clock telling them how I'd been treated. And the next thing I knew, I had a new clock FedEx to me. So we work in the public eye more than we used to. The other part of quality support start is your customer sat ratings or your net promoter scores, because that's the ultimate measure of how well you deliver the product that you have in a support center. Rich, do we, before we dive deep into the mechanics here, uh, do we as a team, as a manager, do we kind of publicize this idea of our quality support start? Do we let this be known that this is what we expect, or is this behind the scenes that management kind of hangs on to, but the, the team itself doesn't know? How, how do you kind of coach people on that front? That's an awesome question. I'm going to break that down to what I call primary versus secondary metrics. Primary metrics are metrics that I'm okay with publicizing because these are things that matter to you and matter to the customer. I'm absolutely okay if the team knows what your aggregate customer SAT rating is. I'm absolutely okay if a support team knows what your costs are or what your sales are. These are that's the lifeblood of what you're doing in the company you're working in. Performance metrics are what I call secondary metrics because they don't matter to the customer. They don't even necessarily matter to the company. They only matter to you because they tie loosely to your costs. And I recommend the secondary metrics. These are your time and seat, average handle time, first call resolution. I think those metrics should be hidden behind the curtain. And I think most people on your team shouldn't hear about these metrics unless they vary far from their norms. What's important about that, and I'm so glad you brought this up, James, is that when you have too many metrics, everybody fails at something, and that has an impact on your team performance. I want everyone to come into work in the morning and feel like they're doing an awesome job, unless they're far off the norms and they need some positive strength-based coaching. So, uh, so my advice is, yeah, you expose the important metrics, the primary metrics, but the performance metrics, you, you keep those behind the curtain and use those as a coaching tool. All right, good stuff. Let's, folks, we're going to move on to that third out of the four parts that Rich is going to go over here, the looking at mechanics. Again, you can keep your questions and comments uh, coming in. Another poll coming up in just a moment or so. And with that, Rich, let's, uh, let's dive into this idea of these mechanics. Okay, so back in our first polling question, speaking of which, when I mentioned there were two things that really made the difference for me in terms of biggest support challenges, the first was the first point that we talked about. Strength-based coaching, which is counterintuitive for most people, and takes practice. Um, when you use that, that is a bedrock for changing the motivation and buy-in for your team. On the other hand, uh, I found that the thing that made us really awesome at what we did was focusing on the mechanics. This gets to two areas, which is uh, your skills and your tools. But before that, I've got an audience poll for you. Again, folks, that has been launched, so you can vote in on that. The question here, when the Detroit Tigers narrowly lost the 2006 World Series, what did manager Jim Leland feel most needed improvement? Was it, and this was him out there talking to uh, the media, first kind of question asked him, was it, hey, we need to improve uh, motivation of the team, we need to improve the discipline, is it the conditioning? Is that what he talked about? Did he talk about pitchers fielding practice? Now, I'm just looking at the language here, Rich. It seems like this it could be a little bit of a, a trick question here. Um, Absolutely. But what, what, uh, one of the things that, uh, as a coach, mm -hmm. I'm thinking I often fall towards discipline. 
that's what I, I look at as a, as a coach. I will talk with my other coaches and say, you know, we weren't as disciplined. We weren't as focused. Maybe those are things we can work on the next practice. I don't necessarily bring that up to the boys, but, you know, talk about that behind the scenes. Um, that's what I might default to thinking that he talked about, but um, am I close? You are close, but this, in fact, it ties in. This is a purposely loaded question. Um, I put it up as a polling question, not just to pulse you folks in the audience as to whether you're guessing correctly, but leading into a story I want to tell. And uh, while you folks are voting, I just wanted to pick up on what you were saying, James. When we were talking off camera before the webinar, I love the fact that when your kids ride home from the game with you, you asked them, what did you enjoy about the game? What was tough about the game? You learn from them and you tap into their motivation. You don't ride home with them and say, you should have caught that ground ball at second base. So you pay attention to how people feel. Jim Leland, when he was manager of the Pirates, when I lived in Pittsburgh, took the Pirates to the National League playoffs three seasons in a row. Their star player, Barry Bonds, always choked in the playoffs and his bats would go silent. And during that third year of playoffs, Leland took him aside one night and said, hey, Barry, you know, if you never get another hit in the playoffs, it's okay. You got us here, and that's what's important. So look, just enjoy the experience, and I'll be fine with whatever happens. That got Barry to relax, and the very next night he hit a stand-up double and then a home run and won the game. I was at that game, and I'll never forget that when Barry was on second base, you could see on the video monitor, you could read his lips saying, it's over. And so Jim focused on motivation here. Now here's my trick question. Okay, so most people chose motivation or discipline. None of them chose the right answer, which is pitcher's fielding practice. This is totally a trick question. You would have never gotten this unless I told you the story. And I'm using it to lead into the story. The Detroit Tigers lost the World Series based on two infield fielding errors on the part of their pitchers. And so when Jim Leland got up in front of the press after losing the World Series, and I watched this on TV. The very first thing he talked about was, when we go into spring training, we're going to focus on pitchers' fielding practice. And so the point I want to make in this story is attitude, motivation, even preparation are all fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, you live or die in your mechanics. And that's what I want to talk about next here is how to focus on your mechanics. And, uh, so... Good performance is not just a matter of skills, but building confidence in those skills. And in a support team, you're juggling a lot of balls. You have to know your product, obviously. You have to become experts in how to work with difficult customer situations. You also have to know all the internal processes of your own company in terms of how to escalate and how to deliver things. So I'm going to share with you, aside from strength-based coaching, the other secret that gave our support teams near perfect customer satisfaction ratings, near zero turnover, and sales increases in the middle of a recession. Our equivalent of pitchers field in practice was we were fanatics on knowing how to handle our very worst customer situations. We would have role playing workshops where we would take the toughest scenarios from our CRM systems and we'd role play them and we'd practice the mechanics until we absolutely nailed those. Knowing how to confidently handle our worst case scenarios took the fear out of customer support for our team members and gave them the confidence to be awesome with all of our customers. And this isn't just me. There's actually some good data behind this. Um, I did a lot of collaborative work over the last few years with Carolyn Healy, the publisher of supportindustry.com. She did a lot of survey research in the customer support industry. And back in 2010, these numbers are really still valid today. One of the things that she found that really resonated with me is that when you looked at the amount of training the customer support people do, which on average is less than one week per year for people who are not just being onboarded, people that I call super trainers, these are people who do three weeks or more of training per year for their team, uh, overwhelmingly have customer SAT levels over 90%, whereas only half of people that have less than a week of training, in this case it was three days or less on the survey, had similar results. So being an overtrainer, and I was a fanatical overtrainer in my days in support team, that made a big difference. This is in-service training. This is, you know, calling people around your cubicle to watch scenarios as they're happening. This is taking situations as they happen and turning them into learning moments. My point about training is 
If you bring it up to people in your management, the very first thing you're probably going to hear is, we can't afford that. We don't have the time to do more training. So here's the dirty secret that I want you to take away from this webinar for you. Becoming an overtrainer, in my experience, costs you nothing. If you take a support team of people and you do split shift training, where you take half of them off the phones for a morning and train them, half of them off the phones for an afternoon and train them, when you look two days later at how far behind you are in your backlog, the answer is not at all. You have tremendous flexibility in terms of doing your own in-service training. Um, working cross-functionally in an organization often can help that too. Uh, in my organizations, which was generally doing uh, application software support, we would have a group of trainers that would fly all over the country teaching the product, and then we had a support team that would be on the phone supporting it. By doing some horse trading where our trainers would come in and man the phones while we would go train our staff, and on the other hand, then we would send some of our support people during our less busy periods and send them on airplanes and training, that was a win-win situation because getting on the phone sharpened the skills of our trainers. It gave them work to do when they weren't uh, traveling. And for our support team, them getting out in the field and doing some training for them was like winning a game show. And again, the amount that, that took out of our productivity was nothing. So here's some smart ideas that you can use for your own training, which is role-playing workshops. And again, I want to circle back to Carolyn's survey research. She compared different kinds of training, such as bringing in outside speakers, doing formal workshops. Far and away, the most important form of training for a customer support center is role-playing your actual scenarios. And this is something that you can do in-house, or you can bring in a trainer who is willing to dive into your data and customize it, like I do. But what you want to do here is go through your CRM data, look for themes, look for stuck points where people struggle, and look for your ugliest, hairiest situations, and then role-play those situations. I did regular work role-playing workshops with my teams, and over the years that I was there, I noticed something interesting. At first, I was doing all the coaching, but very soon, it was the team itself that was doing the coaching. And so you want to leverage talented peers to take on that coaching role. I did a lot of flash training on specific techniques, so if something would go wrong or something would go bad, we get the whole team together at the next meeting and workshop in a really positive, humorous way how to handle those things. Um, having people gather around the speakerphone when you've got a difficult customer, watching you put your head in the lion's mouth, very powerful way of building confidence with people because they're watching me or other people with a smile on their face saying, watch me handle this. And then, again, like I mentioned with the trainers or other teams, you know, positive, constructive, cross-training, cross-functional approaches where you're leveraging their strengths to do training. Or where you're maybe sometimes embedding your staff into other teams so that they become experts in the product or experts on how to use or teach the product. That can be very powerful for both people. Hey, Rich, I want to jump in here. Back in February of this year, on the 17th, you and I did a webcast, and what we focused on was we did some role playing. You put me in the position of I was a customer, and sometimes I was angry, sometimes I was passive, whatever. And I thought it was a really cool example of what some role plays can do. Now, David is helping us out from the GoToAssist team. Uh, I'm going to see maybe if he can find a link to that on the archive pages, but uh, I'm sure if you all go to gotoassist.com, you look under the resources, there are additional white papers, there are archives of some previous webcasts, but that would be one I think to look for because it gave, I thought, a great example of what some of these role plays could be. That, that, was, that brings back fond memories for me, James, because you know I, the genesis of that goes actually back before February. The December before that, we did a garden variety workshop on handling difficult customer situations. As you know, that's something I write and teach about a lot. And at the very end of that webinar in December, you tried a, uh, a scenario with me live and impromptu. And people on that webinar, we had hundreds of attendees, they loved it. And in the comments we got afterwards, they were saying, do more of that. And so that's how we came up with that February workshop where we just late stump the chump with each other. I will tell you folks that James is a world-class difficult customer. <laughs> and <laughs> he's had such good time on that. So absolutely. And uh, bring that whole philosophy into your own organization. Have fun with it. And, uh, and uh, you know, get your team learning as a group for how to handle those worst-case scenarios. 
and that was the one last thing I just want to just add here, and we can hang on this uh, slide here, and then we'll get rolling. But as a coach, we had a uh, within our, our soccer. I also coach soccer, and we had a professional in quotes trainer come to be working with my team this year. So I was the coach, but we'd have this other trainer come in, uh, and I never uh, argue that I'm the best technical skills soccer person. I never played. I had my lung taken out when I was eight, and it all started with feeling bad at a soccer game. So I never went back and played. However, I'm a pretty darn good coach and having these other trainers is great because they can work on a lot of the mechanics and so we usually work well together. This coach, this trainer, took all the fun out of training. The boys did not want to come. They wanted to play in the games because the trainer wasn't there and I was along with my assistants. It got to a point where I stood up Walked, uh, walked the talk for the boys and we got rid of that trainer because there was no fun anymore. And hearing that for adults, I think that oftentimes that we just think, well, you got to do training and so training has to be all stuffy. It has to be by the book. It has to be this. And, you know, it doesn't. And, and hearing you saying that, you know, you can have some levity in this, having just that attitude of gather around, watch this person just nailed this situation live as it's happening because he's on a roll or she has just got this underhand, I think is a great reminder for all of us adults that forget that, yeah, the more fun it is, the more engaged we're likely to be with some trainings. Absolutely. End of my soapbox. No, actually, this is, and here's what's important about this, James, is that, and, and everybody else here, is that you know, what you just painted is what sounds at first glance like a dichotomy between having fun and learning the skills. So you think of the stereotype of like the Olympic athlete who trains incessantly under a, under a demanding coach and wins the gold medal. Um, so I bet if you were to talk to that quote unquote professional soccer coach that you brought in, he or she would have said, you know, well, you either have to buckle down and work hard or you can focus on being soft and having fun. So here's what's interesting is at the major league level where there's so much money involved in a successful versus an unsuccessful sports franchise, they've learned in recent years through research and positive psychology and strength-based psychology that a strength-based approach gives much better performance and makes it much more likely that a team will pull together and win championships and it was the bedrock of the dramatic performance changes that I saw in my days in support team. So, James, you not only are standing up for the kids, enjoying the experience, but it's also we've shown that that's the best coaching psychology to have nowadays. So, great point. And that leads us to the last thing I want to talk about today in our webinar, which is, uh, and I, I purposely save this for last, is, you know, the whole purpose of a support operation really revolves around what kind of experience you're delivering to your customers. But I purposely say that for last because really customer satisfaction has its roots in how your employees feel when they come in for work every day. Now one story I've shared you know, in webinars in the past once in a while and I think if you've never been with me before it's worth sharing again. Many years ago I bought a laptop computer and it had horrible support. Any time I would call, I would get these very unmotivated people who would say, oh, yeah, reload Windows. And uh, they really just uh, could care less about anything but pushing me off the phone with stupid answers and making me do all the work. And so one day I'm looking at the manual for this laptop, and I noticed that it has a very familiar address. It's the same street as a company that I was consulting for. And so when I flew out for a visit there, it turned out that that company and the laptop company shared the same parking lot. And so I came in early one morning, and I watched everybody come into work, and the people at that company came in with their heads down, you know, marching in slowly like they were walking off to jail, whereas our people were laughing and joking and waving to each other in the parking lot, and they had wonderful support quality. So I'm guessing that that company probably viewed support as a cost to be minimized as much as possible, probably viewed the employees as people to be criticized or held accountable, and they succeeded in reducing their support cost to zero because within a year they were out of the laptop business. But all of that is the groundwork for having a good experience engaging your customers. And to me this first starts off as a mindset. When I took over the management of a 24-hour call center operation many years ago, when I had my first all-hands meeting, I said to them, I don't want us to be the complaint department. 
you know, I want to set us on track where we are strategically the voice of our customer. And I'll never forget, one of my employees looked up at me with a look of despair and said, but we are the complaint department. And this is where you start thinking in terms of customer experience and how you strategically make that a good experience beyond the mechanics of just solving the problem. So what I did for this webinar is sort of a closing point that I wanted to make is Forbes magazine came up with a good article on six strategies to drive customer engagement. And I wanted to take these six strategies and then turn them around into the mechanics of how you bring that log in your support center. Their first point was make the customer experience more fun. Um, this, I think, starts with making the employee and the customer experience more fun. So once upon a time, support meant you picked up the phone and called for help. Nowadays, um, if you have self-service channels, social media channels, community support where people can post their own experiences and they can share with each other, that makes service more accessible and more fun. Going to mobile support in a world where everyone has mobile devices, this ties in with another important point, which is having the right tools. And that um, is where I finally get to tip my hat to our congenial sponsors here at GoToAssist. Um, it's thanks to inexpensive cloud-based support tools that everybody can inexpensively have the same support channels. So the ability to do remote support, the ability to do live chat support, which is an enabling technology that spreads human intervention to more customers at the same time. Um, all of the having, you know, knowledge bases at your fingertips, these are all tools that years ago required expensive implementations with a cast of thousands, required planning, required infrastructure. Nowadays, you and I can, you know, basically go to a website for GoToAssist, sign up tomorrow, and be productive in minutes. And with inexpensive per-seat cloud-based licensing, give everybody the very best tools, both your customers and your uh, and your people. So if there's one shameless plug I want to make for our sponsors here, it's uh, go investigate those tools and discover how inexpensive and how productive it is to have the very best capabilities for everybody. Our, their second trend was using social media as a tool. And my response to that is have social media response standards. Uh, they're opening a brand new restaurant from a chain in our town. I posted on their social media site because I have some food allergies asking if I could eat, you know, certain, you know, items on their menu. That was two weeks ago. Nobody's ever answered me. So am I going to go back to this chain? Do I have a high opinion of them? Probably not. So leverage social media to have standards um, for both when you respond and how you sound when you do it. Make that part of your support experience. Simplifying the customer experience. Again, this gets to support channels. And my point here, this is borne out again by survey research from people like supportindustry.com and others. Everyone can afford to be in every channel that makes sense for the customers nowadays. So if you haven't looked into that, you should. Using and analyzing your data. Uh, we talked a lot about metrics. And again, to me, this circles back to not just primary and secondary metrics, but also that and the second point about leveraging customer feedback, link your support data as part of the strategic process improvement process of your whole company. If you go through your CRM records and see that 40% of your people are calling with installation questions, go back to your support team and negotiate how to improve the out-of-box experience. And better yet, let your team members carry the lead on that and have a voice in the organization. That's good for the company. That's good for them. Finally, the last uh, customer experience point that Forbes brought up was anticipating customer needs. And if you have enough of an infrastructure, in other words, if you have enough users and if you have the technology, start building a user community where people become part of their own support community and connect with each other as well as with you to both solve the problems and also improve your product and be part of your community. And so with that, um, I just want to wrap up today by saying that strength-based coaching uh, is really the bedrock of changing performance. Metrics are something that with the right metrics, you can use that as a strategic tool to improve yourself and be part of the voice of the organization. Uh, the wrong metrics can fly backwards against those things. There's a lot of good literature out there on that. Overtraining and focusing on the mechanics, and again, I love this focus on your worst case scenarios. Uh, that builds confidence and it also builds skills with people.
those are interpersonal leadership skills that stick with you for the rest of your life. And finally, you do all three of those things and focus on the strategic customer experience, and you have, my friends, a World Series team for customer support. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to you folks in the audience and to you, James, um, see if you folks have any questions or any feedback. Yeah, absolutely. And again, folks, uh, we have been recording. One of the questions was, have we recorded this event? Is there an archive? Absolutely. So we're going to get those reminder emails out to all of you. Also, I mentioned David from the GoToAssist team is on board with us. He came through in a big way. He found that archive, Rich, of those uh, worst situations. It was solve your worst support yeah. situations. So he put that link out to everybody in the chat tab. So you have access to that. So I encourage you to do that. Also, he put out a link about a free trial for Go to assist if you're interested so you can follow those links that David shared. One of the buckets of, uh, I try and collect buckets of questions that come in and one of the ones that was uh, the ideas flown around in our Q&A is the timing, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, unless through free agency, people go out and buy a ton of great players and those uh -huh. great players come together uh, emotionally and they have the same respect for each other, it's not all those egos, maybe you can go from worst to first, but it doesn't often happen overnight. So I'm going to bring up the question here of what type of patience does a manager have to have? How long might it take to build a World Series team? Because I doubt it's gonna happen three months from now if someone's listening to us today and starts implementing these things. It might not be three months, but they're gonna be better in three months than they are today. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm gonna, Take the old. Uh, I'm going to take the old proverb: you know, hire for attitude, train for skills, and turn it on its head. Because where I think improving performance is going to take time is when you have the right technical chops. Those either again you import the right talents, or you have to build those talents slowly over time. On the other hand, in terms of people having good attitude, absolutely you should hire people that are oriented towards working with people and working in a team. It's very important, but those are all mechanics. I'm going to tell you, James, that you know the support teams I managed, uh, I generally inherited them, and you had every personnel in the face of the earth. I joked that it was kind of like the seven dwarfs, you know, sleepy, dopey, doc, grumpy, and so forth. What I found that when you taught people the right customer skills and you use a strength-based approach, within a very short period of time, I'm going to say three months. It's funny you put that, uh, that, that stake in the ground out there. Within about a three-month period, Everybody sounded awesome, and we lost the sense of Joe's good with people and Sally isn't good with people. Everyone was great when they learned the skills. So, um, so I, I think if you're going to focus on, you know, what kind of skills you want to build over time, focus on people's technical chops because that's I think a big part of the, the good customer experience, and uh, look at your own good coaching skills uh, for the soft skill side of things. That can come along a lot quicker than you think. The customer service survival kit is still getting a lot of love out there. It was penned by Rich. Rich, how uh, this is? Uh, it still trends well, and yeah. and people are still picking it up. This was a kind of a, a love for you, and and Absolutely. people can still pick it up. Amazon, anywhere online. Anywhere on Amazon. The two books that I want to recommend is the Customer Service Survival Kit, which is on how to handle your worst customer situations. This book launched at number one in 2013 still bounces in and out of the top 24 years later. Um, I'm really proud of that book, and it's it's all neat on how to handle your worst customer situations. Uh, the other book I'm going to mention just quickly is How to Tell Anyone Anything, which is a uh, book that focuses on how to do strength-based coaching with your employees in difficult employee situations. Uh, both of those are still selling well. I'm going to tell you a little secret for those of you who are listening on the webinar today. Um, my publisher has put the Kindle version of how to tell anyone anything on sale for three dollars. So uh, if you want to get a really cheap look at the strength-based coach we're talking about, go spend three bucks and get, get a copy of how to tell anyone anything. Awesome, good stuff, folks. I just chatted out one more time. You can follow Rich on Twitter at Gallagher P O C. Really do appreciate all of you taking time to join us for the event. Look for the reminder email. We'll bring you back to the archive. Share that with folks that you think can benefit. A uh, short little survey pops up when we close things down. So appreciate your feedback on that. Again, I appreciate Rich being on board. Thanks to the uh, the Go to Assist team for sponsoring today's event. Getting Rich on board and getting all of you out to this event. Really do appreciate it.
it. With that, we are going to wrap things up. Again, my name is James Hilliard, and we do look forward to talking to you all down the road.